Thank you very much, Ben. So um, I hear that we have some students here, some participators uh, ranging from high school students to world experts in signal processing. So uh, everybody listen along at your own pace here. And if you have any questions, please do feel free to go ahead and raise your hand. So we are going to be talking about the data. So we're going to run through what is in a data file. So you'll practice popping these open on your own. So we're going to go over what you'll find inside our open data files. Um, so in particular, we're going to go into what does our strain data look like. So as Dave mentioned, this is the time series of the space-time strain measurement that we make. So we're going to look at this in the time domain, the frequency domain, and then a time and frequency decomposition. And then we will move on to data quality. So these are artifacts that anyone who is intaking our data should be aware of. So we're going to focus on transients. So these are artifacts that are well localized in time, similar to the way that you would expect a transient gravitational wave signal to be. And then also lines. So Dave mentioned these briefly, these uh, spectral lines. And then we'll touch on how we mitigate these noise artifacts. So um, part of the open data product that you receive includes data quality vetoes. So these are identified times of poor data quality. Um, we'll touch on analysis dependent mitigation techniques that you might uh, perform depending on the type of astrophysical analysis you're interested in, uh, which is mostly a preview for other talks that will come later today. And then finally, a little bit on event validation and then a, a list of resources and references that you can go ahead and use as you um, work with the open data. So we'll start with what is in a LIGO data file. So I pulled this very nice summary from the LIGO Open Data Center, the LIGO Open Science Center um, website, tutorial number two. Um, so there are three main components within a LIGO data file. So there's metadata, and this is the basic information about what's contained. So this is which interferometer, what are the times covered. Um, so we will sort of leave that there, and you can practice reading that in um, later on today and tomorrow. And then there is the strain data. So this is the time series that is the space-time strain measurement that we make. And we will spend uh, a bit of time in this talk talking about what that looks like and useful ways you can plot it to understand it. And then we'll also talk about the quality of this data. So there is also within a LIGO open data file this one hertz sample um, time series that describes the quality of the data at this time as relevant for whichever type of analysis you might be interested in, at least transient analyses. So uh, what does the LIGO strain data look like? So to echo what Dave said briefly, um, what is this LIGO strain data? So we have, for our basic interferometer layout, we have our input laser light. This is split by a beam splitter, and 50% of it goes along each of these perpendicular arms, which are four kilometers long. Um, and then if we call this the... Uh, Y arm, so this big L sub Y, and the X arm, big L sub X, um, this is, uh, this will yield our strain calculation. So this is strain H of T, which is the difference between changes in length of each of these two arms divided by four kilometers, which is our arm length. So this is fundamentally the measurement that we're making. And then of course, as Dave mentioned, it's a little bit more complicated than this. We're actually taking our control signal that we're using to push on the mirrors to keep the light resonance inside our arm cavities. And then as Alex mentioned, he's going to spend about half an hour telling you about how we calibrate that um, signal into units of strain. So that's what our signal is. Now what does it look like? So this is um, a time series of LIGO Hanford data. So this is taken from the first observing run, which is now open to the public, and you'll be able to, um, to play with this afternoon and tomorrow and the day after with tutorials. So what you're looking at is strain amplitude and then versus seconds. And this is just the, uh, the calibrated data that you can read in straight from the open data file. 
Um, so as Dave mentioned, the sampling rate for the LIGO detectors is about 16 kilohertz. Um, the open data files that I believe you'll be um, using or able to access today and in the near future are sampled at about 4 kilohertz. So this is the time series in the time domain. What does this look like in the frequency domain? So if you take the same time series data that we just showed you and break it down into the frequency components, um, so brief overview for students who are with us. Um, it can be shown that any time series can be written as some function of um, added sinusoids. So I can express any time series as some summation of some sinusoids multiplied by some other maybe time dependent function. So this is what this plot is telling me is um, what the contribution at each frequency is to the time series that I just showed you. So this is uh, strain noise amplitude, and then this is frequency. So this has the same more or less shape as we saw from, uh, from Dave's talk earlier. So this, was, uh, this is a, an amplitude spectral density estimated with some fast Fourier transforms, and then Duncan McLeod will be talking a little bit more about um, what these are and how you can use them to, um, to look at LIGO data a little bit later on today. Um, but we can notice that this um, amplitude spectral density of the same calibrated LIGO Hanford um, spacetime strain data has the same shape that Dave showed. So it looks a little bit different because um, we used shorter fast Fourier transform lengths and less averaging. So um, this will become important later on as we try to look at things from the perspective of the long duration astrophysical searches which average over um, a lot of time, so on the scale of months, to try to resolve um, very, very small um, lines in the data. So these would be their astrophysical signals. Um, but it has the same general shape, so below about 50 hertz or so, um, we see this contribution that's dominated by seismic noise and then um, this is also high passed, so for uh, open data, for both of our LIGO detectors, it is high passed in the open data version, which is um, just showing you the component that's um, above where our calibration is valid. And then we have this component here that's dominated by shot noise, and then also, as Dave mentioned, you have these, um, these spectral lines. So we talked about the 60 hertz power line that's from the AC power grid in the United States and also its associated harmonics, so multiples of 60 hertz, you'll see strong lines. Um, Dave mentioned the violin mode here at 500 hertz, and again, you will, if you plot for um, higher frequencies, see harmonics of this as well. Um, here at about 34 hertz is a calibration line that we intentionally inject by um, actuating onto the mirrors so that we can calibrate our um, strain measurement, which Alex will talk about later. So here, it's important to take a brief segue into uh, how the interferometers interact with their environment. Um, so as Dave mentioned, these are very, very complicated instruments with a lot of different components, and they have very complicated interactions with their environment. Um, so what you're looking at here, so this is, it's cut off a little bit, this is earth.nullschool.net, which is a cool website, um, you should go visit. But what you're looking at here is a map of wind speed around the world. So color is showing you the uh, strength, and then you'll see these lighter lines that are showing you the direction. Um, so we have our two detectors. One is here in Washington State, and the other is here, as was mentioned, in the swamp um, in Louisiana. And um, weather patterns do affect us. So particularly for our LIGO Livingston interferometer, um, we will see ground motion from the waves beating up on the shore, both in the Atlantic and also in the Gulf of Mexico. So when there's a storm off the shore, especially if the waves are aligned um, towards the detector as they're hitting the shore, so you can see this um, from the, the wind direction, then this shakes the ground, and this is microseismic noise that make it difficult for us to um, maintain light resonance. It makes it difficult for our control loops to be able um, to maintain the resonance of the light within the interferometers, and this costs us observing time when we're unable to maintain this light resonance. 
So this is, gives you an idea of what the duty cycle is for a two detector network. So this is the two um, LIGO detectors. And it ends up being fairly similar to what you'd expect for an electromagnetic observatory, which, of course, this is driven by uh, the day-night cycle and weather, clouds. Um, but for us, it's largely ground motion and wind. So anything that shakes the ground and couples into mechanically um, into the motion of our mirrors. Um, so this is publicly available information, the LIGO network duty factor for the first observing run. So this is the observing run that has been released um, in the form of open data. So we had about um, 42, 43% um, with our two detector network up. So the reason it's not higher than this is because one of the other detectors was uh, not taking data. Um, and then we had in single interferometer mode about a third of the time, and then uh, about 24% or a quarter of the time we didn't have any interferometer online. And just to give you a rough idea for each detector, how much time is spent in each configuration, um, so I, I wanted to make sure I noted that this is a, a rough estimate that's based on um, human input accounting rather than this, auto, this nice automated state vector um, summary. But this is an operating mode overview, so green here. So this is time spent in observing mode. So for the Livingston detector during a one, this was about 60% or so. And then orange here, this is time that we had t spent trying to lock the interferometer. And what I mean by lock is achieve this light resonance in the arms and all of the um, other optical cavities that Dave mentioned. Um, so brown here is interesting. So this is environmental time. So this is time we're unable to achieve um, resonance or lock um, due to environmental factors. So this is um, earthquakes and uh, the ringing down of the ground motion after earthquakes, the ringing down of the ground motion and also um, our instruments. And then also we talked about wind, we talked about microseism. So these are the dominant um, environmental factors in, uh, in our duty cycle. And now that we've talked about duty cycle, we can mention that these complicated environmental interactions as well as uh, detector behavior can also introduce these noise transients and artifacts into the data. So this is the same time series that we were looking at before. So this is just some calibrated data for about 20 seconds for LIGO Hanford during the first observing run. But now what happens if I take the same time series and then I apply the simple filter to it. So I'm selecting for just data um, between 10 and 200 hertz. And then I'm also notching out this very strong 60 hertz line. Um, what I get is that there appears to be some very uh, well localized high amplitude distortion in the data right at about 11 seconds. So I might wonder to myself, what is this? And um, I can look in the frequency domain to help me figure out and see what's happening. So what you're seeing here, so this is the same um, filtered data that we were looking at before. So this is the calibrated LIGO Hanford H of T, so this gravitational wave strain data, with again this um, selecting for data between 10 and 200 hertz and uh, rejecting data at this very strong line of 60 hertz. Um, so what I'm going to show you is I'm going to take this rectangle and I'm going to um, slide it along in time. And thank you very much to Duncan McLeod for um, helping make this plot with GWPi. Um, so I'm going to slide this rectangle along in time and I'm going to use that to estimate the frequency content of the signal in this rectangle. So here below I have this, um, this amplitude spectral density. So this is frequency versus uh, strain noise amplitude. And then this orange line, this reference, is the same ASD that we were looking at before. And then um, in blue, plotted on top of it, this is the frequency spectral content just within this rectangle. So we're going to play this movie and see what happens. Yep. We should do. Oh no. Yeah, we, we unlocked it. Um, hmm.
That's strange. I wonder if I pop out, maybe? Let's see if I can play it from here. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I can see it. You can't see it. <laughs> Oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll work with that, and then I'll I'll pop back into uh, presenter mode. Okay. So um, what we're looking at here. So again, this is the time series, and I'm dragging this rectangle along in time. And now what you can see in blue is the spectral content that's contained, that's estimated to be within that rectangle that I'm sliding along in time. Um, and if I watch what's happening relative to that orange reference curve underneath, I can see that as my rectangle passes over whatever this distortion is, um, let's watch it again carefully, that I can see this excess signal content from about 200 to 10 hertz, which again was the motivation for selecting this particular bandpass filter. So um, if you would like to make this plot, um, you are very welcome to go to this link, so you should be able to access these slides. And um, this is made entirely with GWPy by with uh, open data frames, and you can follow along uh, with the instructions here. And thank you to Duncan for putting that together. Okay, let's see if we can play this. Excellent. Oh well. Pff, okay. There we go. So um. This motivates a time and frequency decomposition. So what I can do is take that same data chunk. So this is, a, this is unfiltered data. So this is calibrated H of T. And this is a spectrogram that I've made using overlapping fast Fourier transforms. So what is a spectrogram? So this is the same 20 seconds that we've been looking at for this data series. And then um, this is the frequency content that's estimated per unit time. So what you can see is um, essentially a different discrete rectangles. So I'm taking my data and I'm projecting it into time and frequency and I'm looking at how my, how my time and frequency content is changing as this um, time series evolves. So the color here, this is normalized amplitude. And how I calculate that is for each frequency bin, so for each row of these rectangles and frequency, I can make a histogram of the amplitude of my signal. I can find the median, and then I can normalize each one of these rectangles by the median of that histogram. So I'm taking my data, and I'm normalizing it to the median per each frequency bin. And then the color is going to tell me how much excess power, how much excess amplitude I have um, per unit time and per unit frequency. So um, we can see here now in, uh, in this time frequency projection that our data is actually um, showing distinct kind of arch-like features. And I can do even better if I'm a little bit more clever about how I am tiling this time and frequency space. So I can choose to use, instead of overlapping fast Fourier transforms, which give me these nice even rectangles, I can choose to use what's called the Q transform. Um, so what's happening here is instead of evenly spaced normal rectangles, um, I can project my data onto this train of sine Gaussians. Um, so the sine Gaussians are sort of tracing out the width of each one of my um, rectangular tiles in time. And then the frequency is um, governed by the frequency of the sinusoid. And then Q will also tell me how wide this tile will be in... Um, in frequency. So this is my y-axis on my spectrogram. Um, so Q is useful. So we have here some representations of um, sine Gaussian tiles with the same frequency and varying Q. So for Q, some, this is called the quality factor um, in some physics and electrical engineering circles. Um, so for low Q, um, for this y-axis or uh, this delta frequency, so my um, how sort of tall my time frequency rectangle is, um, this will give me a, a very well localized in time tile, but a much broader in frequency tile. Um, middle Q is sort of roughly equivalent, equal uh, in time and frequency. And then for a high Q, um, this will give me not a very well localized in time, but well localized in frequency tile. 
And the Q-transform is um, particularly useful to us because it's more useful for us to have this um, well-localized and frequency uh, tiling at lower frequencies and better localized and time at higher frequencies. So this is for this Q-transform, so for my, the central frequency of whatever rectangle um, I'm using to tile my space, um, I have this inverse relationship with how uh, tall my rectangle is. Um, so we can project this onto multiple planes in Q. So this is a Q plane, so this is the frequency, which is, again, um, oriented 90 degrees to the spectrogram we were just looking at, um, and then my time axis. Um, so for increasing frequency, we can see how this shape is changing for constant Q, and then I can make multiple Q planes. I can vary my Q, so this is sort of coming out um, at an angle from the screen, um, and I can tile up the same data in a different um, time frequency representation using a different Q. And this way, I can get multiple different um, rectangular tilings, and I can see which one best captures the excess power that I'm looking for. So we're about to see an example. So what you're looking at here, so this is, a, again, the same normalized spectrogram in frequency versus time. And now, this is the Q transform result. So this is frequency versus time, but we see now that we've made this choice to get a better frequency resolution at lower frequencies and better time resolution at higher frequencies, we, and there's also some interpolation that's happening here that's not shown in the plot above, we can start to resolve um, the shapes of these features much better. So this is also particularly helpful for when you're looking for chirp signals. So you'll see the, you will have seen a characteristic time frequency um, evolution that looks something like this for uh, two compact objects that are inspiraling and merging. Um, so the Q transform, if you're just looking for the generic power of these signals, is also a very useful transform. And you'll practice using this a little bit later on. So the Q transform is our favored way to look for transient artifacts and transient noise. And there are public options available. So what you can do is go to qscan.lago.org. You don't need to log in. You don't need to know any programming whatsoever. You can just put in a GPS time, and then it will spit back out a result that has been Q transformed. So what I did was I put in this GPS time. So this is the GPS time of the example we were just looking at. And then this is the result. So this is frequency versus time. And then this is the same normalized energy. So um, this is JET, the JET color scheme, which is perhaps not as colorblind friendly. <laughs> but um, we'll, uh, we'll work with the developers at MIT, um, who is Satya Mahapra. And um, hopefully we'll get that a little bit better. Also, I wanted to advertise coming soon, we will have LIGO Data Viewer Web. So this is a GUI interface that we already have available to internal um, LIGO data analysts. And it will support time series, some minimal filtering of the time series, um, generating uh, power spectral density and amplitude spectral density plots, spectrograms that we were just working with, the Q transform that we were just working with, and also um, other simple plots like Ben limited root mean square to look at how the power is changing over time. So please stay tuned. This will be hosted through the LEGO Open Science Center. So we expect that uh, probably on the scale of months, and that should be a very useful tool. Yes, please go ahead. Um, doesn't the um, wavelet transform do something similar? And do you also look at wavelet transforms? So the question is, do we also look at wavelet transforms so we, we do um, as a collaboration. So I think of San Gaussians as a sort of wavelet. Um, but we have sort of these generic uh, coherence gravitation wave searches that do use Meyer wavelets. So this is coherent wave burst, which is our flagship um, gravitational wave search for unmodeled sources. And then um, we also have Bayes wave, which is a Bayesian version that uses more like a Bohr wavelet. So San Gaussians are a nice choice because it's sort of the um, minimal number of wavelets that you would need to collect the most power. It's a non-orthogonal basis, and it's a fine choice for us here. Okay, so now that we know, oh, yes, please go ahead.
Getting back to my microphone, the question is, when we do this dynamical Fourier transform, is there any concern about the window size? Yes, so um, how long your, Fourier, your fast Fourier transform length is, this will govern the frequency resolution that you're able to achieve. So if you want better frequency resolution, then you're going to necessarily have to intake more data into that fast Fourier transform. So we will see an example coming up with much, much longer fast Fourier transform lengths and much longer averages used to estimate our amplitude spectral density. And we will see that there are hidden underneath the surface many, many more lines than we can see with our one and a half second FFT length with five averages. So good question. Okay, so we've seen what our data looks like at a basic level in time and frequency, and now we're going to move on to talking about noise artifacts. So as we've seen, so we just saw an example of what light scattering looks like, see these distinct arches in time and frequency. But um, clearly LIGO data is non-stationary, non-Gaussian. So these are two examples of artifacts that are still present in LIGO open data and are known to contribute to background outliers for searches for both um, compact binary coalescences and also for unmodeled bursts. So something to watch out for if you are analyzing, planning to analyze the data to run a search. Um, so these two examples, so on the left, these are called blip glitches. So these are the biggest contributor to all types of transient gravitational wave searches. Um, so they are seen in both detectors and were during the first observing run, so both in LIGO Livingston and LIGO Hanford at about a rate of once per hour to give you an idea of how often they appear. Um, we, we have no concrete, a uh, known correlation with the instrument behavior or the environment yet, so these are still unresolved for the second observing run as well. Um, high priority target for commissioning and investigation. Um, but they're particularly uh, troublesome because if you decompose them in time and frequency, so this is time on the scale of about 200 milliseconds, and then this is frequency um, on the y-axis. So what you can see here is that this, this blip glitch has about the same time frequency morphology as a very short duration in spiral, particularly one of about um, a mass ratio of approaching 0.1, and um, so some high um, mass ratio, and also anti-line spin. So this is very, very difficult for our mesh filter searches to distinguish from real astrophysical signals for a single interferometer. So a longer duration example is the 60 to 200 hertz non-stationary noise on the right. So this is primarily seen at LIGO Livingston, and um, it's a longer duration than the blip glitch, so it lasts on the order of tens or hundreds of seconds, so about uh, a few minutes. Um, it's a major contributor to the transient search backgrounds, and it's seen in, a, in a storms of about, so these each last about a few minutes, and then we'll see uh, many of them in about an hour, hour or two long stretch, um, roughly once every few weeks to give you an idea of how often they occur. And uh, this is an overview of the menagerie of uh, common glitch types we have in both of our interferometers. And you can learn more with this public tool, um, Gravity Spy. And it's described in this paper by Mike Seven et al. That was published last year. So if you go to gravityspy.org, so this is a citizen science effort where we've enlisted um, members of the public to help us to classify our common glitch um, types into these known categories. Um, so we, of course, would welcome the help if you're interested in helping us to classify these glitch types. Um, but you will see available to you this list of uh, common glitch types with some nice Q-scan, Q-transform representations of what they look like in the data. So there's about 20 types here, and they, they cover a lot of the most common glitch types that were seen in the first observing run. So this is a good resource for people who want to learn more about the types of glitches that are in the data. So next is combs. So we had a great question um, about what happens when you use different uh, time duration to estimate your power spectral density. Um, so this is a plot that's taken from this recent paper by Pep Kovas that was just published um, 
uh, late 2017. Um, and this paper was used to generate this uh, catalog of instrumental lines. So for anyone who's interested in analyzing the data, this is an excellent reference for what instrumental lines are present in the data. So this is for both LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston, and it's hosted on the LIGO Open Science Center. So um, this is a great resource for you as well. Um, but as we briefly touched on before, so what we're looking at here, now instead of taking um, averages of about a total of um, five or so seconds with one and a half second Fourier transform, uh, fast Fourier transform links, we now have uh, over 7,000 second long averaging with uh, fast Fourier transform links that are on the order of hundreds of seconds. So now you can start to see appearing uh, much more prominently these fainter lines and combs. So combs are what we call lines that repeat at some integer um, frequency. So what we're seeing down here, so this is for LIGO Hanford for the first observing run. And uh, what you're seeing here below about a few hundred hertz is this one to two hertz comb series. So the, the comb that's appearing about a hertz and in, at intervals of half a hertz has to do with blinking LEDs. So we have a timing system that we use to imprint GPS times onto our, our network of detectors and this timing system to indicate that it's working correctly has an LED that blinks at once per second. And um, the, uh, the changing electromagnetic field at once per second was responsible for a lot of these lines you see here, which was um, mitigated to some degree for the next observing run, which we haven't released the data for yet. Um, but there are other examples of lines and combs that we've mitigated that are described um, completely in this paper. So if you're interested in longer duration searches or spectral features, please do um, go check that out. So now we are going to discuss um, ways which we can mitigate these noise artifacts that we've identified. So we do have data quality information available via the LIGO Open Science Center. So as we mentioned earlier, this is part, this is a, one of the three major pieces of a, a, a LIGO data file. So what's contained within that LIGO data file um, are a series of uh, data quality information and then also injection information. Um, so let's do the top first. So these data quality bits will tell you, um, is there data present? And then we have uh, two different transient search types of data quality indicated. So CBC is the compact binary coalescence search in categories one to three, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then we also have independently defined um, categories for burst searches, which are unmodeled generic um, gravitational wave searches. So below, this is telling you whether or not there is a hardware injection present. So as part of um, testing the interferometer and testing our data analysis pipelines, what we can do is to inject motion into the mirrors that imitates a true gravitational wave signal and then try to recover that um, accurately with our uh, data analysis pipelines. So what you're looking at here is a, a compact binary coalescence hardware injection presence, um, same for burst. So we have detector characterization that we use to, um, to calculate the sensitivity of our network of auxiliary channels to gravitational wave strain, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, continuous waves, so these would be near sinusoids, and then stochastic. So um, you have all of this information available to you as well that will indicate whether or not a signal that your tool or pipeline or analysis algorithm identifies as a hardware injection or not. So let's go back and walk through what these different categories of data quality information mean. So first up, we have data. So this is, is data present at this time in, um, in our open data uh, files? So this covers both, was there light resonant into the, in the interferometer? Was it in a nominal configuration? And also is the calibration valid? So that's all contained in this data um, information. So for data quality information, category one is the most um, serious category. So this indicates some um, critical issue with some key component of the interferometer. So this is the interferometer 
or perhaps even um, the calibration not operating in a nominal mode. So this is not analyzable data. Um, as a result, all of these times are identical for all of the different analyses. So CBC and burst and CW and stochastic um, don't analyze this data. And also times that um, fall under category one are not available via open data. So for category two, this is now where we get into defining um, data quality information independently for each of the different types of searches. Um, so this is some known, well understood physical coupling that generates or that is associated with some, um, con some contribution to the background for the search. So this is why um, the CBC search might choose to, def to uh, define um, category two vetoes differently than the unmodeled burst search because when you use match filtering, this is a much better um, selector against your background and what you're trying to do when you identify what your total analysis time is, is maximize your um, search sensitivity. So you want to maximize both the volume out um, that you can see, and this is um, done by mitigating uh, high significance background events. So you could gain in volume by cutting time, but then you want to balance this with the amount of time that you cut out of the analysis. So that's sort of the governing principle of why the different searches might define um, categories two and three differently. So category three, um, so this is some statistical coupling to the gravitational wave channel. So this is empty for the CBC search, um, but I believe it's present for the burst search. So um, data quality levels are cumulative. So um, something that fails category one will then automatically um, fill categories two and three. And um, they, as we said, are defined independently for each of the different analysis types. So how are these segments defined and identified? So 401 and all of the prior um, analyses. So every time that we define a data quality veto, we require some auxiliary witness. So this is environmental channels and channels that are monitoring the behavior of the detector. Um, so we mentioned safety, we mentioned um, talking about hardware injections, um, that this is some measurements of the coupling of this auxiliary channel um, to or some sensitivity to this gravitational wave strain. So what we don't want to do is veto data based on a channel that's sensitive to gravitational waves because then we'll be vetoing real signals. Um, so safety is a requirement for the definition of these vetoes. And then they're um, based on known instruments or environment noise sources that couple to H of T um, in a way that impacts the background for each search. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like in terms of auxiliary channels, so we have hundreds of thousands of independent time series. That's what we mean when we say auxiliary channels. Um, and these measure the environment and also um, the different aspects of the detector behavior. And we can use these to identify correlations between noise sources and our gravitational wave strain data. Um, so this is an example in a time series where this is amplitude and this is time. So this is our gravitational wave strain data H of T. And then uh, we have identified some transients or glitches in this channel. And we do see some correlations. So there's wind here that's correlated with this glitch. And then two for this microphone time series. But then they're all, there are also examples where we do not have an effective auxiliary channel witness. So this would be the blips and the um, 60 to 200 hertz noise that we saw earlier. So part of the experimental design of the LAGO instruments is this array of physical environment channels. So particularly um, that any environmental source that could potentially affect multiple detectors within the light travel time, or which is the gravitational um, wave travel time, um, we should be able to have an array of sensors such that we would sense that signal um, much more strongly in our environmental sensors than we would in our gravitational wave strain. So it's part of our instrument design um, to check and validate our candidate events. Um, so this is a schematic of the interferometer layout. So this is the input laser. Here's the beam splitter. Here are the two arms. And these are contained in three separate buildings. So this is called the corner station. And then at the end of each of the two arms are these end stations. 
And in each of these three buildings, we have an array of accelerometers, microphones, temperature sensors, magnetometers that we are always continuously monitoring. And here is an example of a very good auxiliary witness channel. Um, so this is a time, this is LIGO Hanford data during the second observing run, the beginning of the second observing run. Um, this is frequency versus time, and this is a Q transform spectrogram where this, uh, this power is um, normalized power in the signal. So this is our gravitational wave channel, and this is a microphone near our pre-stabilized laser. So this is our laser input enclosure that Dave showed. So hopefully the sound works, and we'll try playing what this sounds like. We might. There we go. So um that's that's a real thing that happened in the beginning of the second observing run, so this data is not yet released, um, but we, what we can do with an effective witness, so you see that the coupling is fairly linear between this microphone and our gravitational wave strain data, is we can very easily identify exactly the affected times and remove them from analysis with a um, category two veto. So just to give you an example of uh, the definition of another type of veto. So this was a uh, data quality veto that was category one and responsible for most of the, uh, the time lost to vetoing um, in the first observing run. So this is for the LIGO Hanford detector. Um, so what you're looking at is this root mean square amplitude of um, the signal for a 45 megahertz modulation. So um, as Dave was saying, we have multiple independent um, optical cavities so this is a light modulation introduced to the laser light to control the output cavity. So this is the signal recycling cavity um, that the light enters as it exits the uh, beam splitter towards the photodiode readout. So um, what we noticed is that when there were spikes of power in this uh, modulation signal, what this would introduce is a huge rate of non-stationarity in our HFT data. So what you're looking at down here, so this is frequency versus time and hours of our gravitational wave strain data at LIGO Hanford. And each one of these dots is a representation in this um, Q transform basis of some high signal to noise ratio excess power in the data. Um, so dots that are darker in color are louder. And what we see when we apply a veto that's just based on the threshold in excess power and our modulated light signal, so this is the faulty light that's going in that we can monitor um, to define time segments to cut out of the data. So this is responsible for something on the order of five or six percent dead time in the first observing run. But this does buy us um, an improvement in significance of events. So Alex Nitz is gonna talk much more about calculating uh, event significance and what the uh, detection statistic is for um, our CBC searches. But what you're looking at here, so this is um, the signal to noise ratio uh, that's network reweighted. So this is our detection statistic, and this is the value for a real gravitational wave event. Um, so this is GW151226, which is the second ever detected signal, a binary black hole. And this is from the first observing run. So the signal is in the data that you'll be looking at. And how we calculate the significance of these events is that you take its identified detection statistic, so this is about 12.9 or so, and then you compare it to your noise background, which Alex will talk more about um, how it is that we calculate this. Um, but so we can calculate our noise background with, um, without any of our data quality information applied. So this is information that we have about how our detectors in their environments are impacting HFT. Um, and if we had done that without cutting any time out whatsoever um, and compared that to our event significance, we would have gotten about 2.9 or so 
significance. And this would have earned it a LIGO Virgo trigger designation. But um, fortunately, we did undertake studies to understand our, environment, our detector and their environments better. Um, we used that to uh, judiciously cut out s as small an amount of time as we could um, to mitigate those problems. And when you uh, calculate the background with that, just using that time, um, and you compare this to your event significance, you get over five sigma, which earns it this gold-plated uh, GW designation. So um, Alex will be talking more about how, what this value means and also how these um, background distributions are calculated. And then finally, once we've identified an event in a, at high significance, the last step is to validate it. Um, so the questions that we ask ourselves, so is there some noise or non-stationarity in the data present that could account for this signal? So that could have caused it. And then um, the step below this, if the answer to that is no, is there um, noise or non-stationary that could interfere with our ability to accurately extract the, um, the source properties? So if you'll have read the story about our binary neutron star um, detection, this is a, an issue that we have dealt with before. So um, I wanted to note that auxiliary sensors, we do internally consider these a crucial test for event validation, but unfortunately these channels are not um, yet released as open data. So the tools that you do have available to you are these um, time frequency decompositions and um, catalogs of lines, known lines, instrumental lines, and these catalogs of glitch sources. So all of those resources are available to you. And we will end with a summary of uh, references that you might find useful as you are analyzing LIGO data. So if you're interested in glitches, if you're doing a transient search or source, um, transient source uh, property estimation, um, there is this uh, sort of complete description of detector characterization for the first observing run that was uh, written surrounding the very first observed event. So that's um, on the archive here. Um, there's also a very nice description of the uh, data quality information for the CBC searches for the first observing run um, that was just published last year. There's also Gravity Spy, which will give you, again, this catalog of uh, glitch classes in each of the two detectors. Um, for lines, we do have our lines paper, which was published very recently. Um, and then the lines catalog, which is available to you on the Open Science Center websites. And then the calibration is also a nice resource for calibration lines. So this is a published around the first detection event. Um, and then uh, it's worth noting that in specific event releases, um, especially for O2 data, um, that the calibration lines and the 60 hertz lines were subtracted using our auxiliary witness channels, um, but not for the nominal open data. Um, so other resources, uh, the LEGO Open Science Center does produce data quality information references that's linked here. Um, you can make a Q scan anytime you want in a GUI. All you need to do is put in the GPS time at qscan.lego.org. And then hopefully coming very soon is this public tool that you'll be able to use to make a wider variety of plots. Um, and then also I'd be completely remiss to not note that we do have public interferometer status monitoring through the Open Science Center. And this is uh, this de detector status page. So especially during an observing run, you can look and within about a few hours, you should be able to see what's happening with the detectors, how sensitive are they, were they online. Um, so that's it. I welcome any questions that you have anytime. <laughs>